Welcome to University. Uh, we are here with uh, fashion and retail icons, entrepreneurs, business builders, mentors, and friends, Mickey Drexler and Neil Blumenthal. Welcome, guys. It is awesome to have you here. Thanks for having us. It's nice so, to be here. That was quite a buildup. I know. No, when you say something like that, it's you know your mother would say that, but yeah, and you know and, I mean? and I believe it. Okay, go ahead. So <laughs> we started. We want to start university with um, a couple of icebreakers. Uh, so Mickey, I'll start with you. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I had uh, scrambled egg whites, uh, decaf coffee, and uh, seven grain toast. Was that like a typical breakfast? You know, it's pretty typical. Um, because I, I usually go out and I do a breakfast meeting-ish with people who I want to catch up with, but that, that's probably three or four days when I have breakfast out of seven. Really? Um, I'm going to sound like a yuppie. Um, I had an acai bowl. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it? I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. It's, acai is a super fruit from Brazil, so some sliced banana in there, some peanut butter. Good. Um, second question. What do you guys wake up for? You want to answer first or? Sure. Uh, uh, I wake up for my four and a half year old son who will yell for me uh, when I'm dead asleep to come hang out with him in the morning, which is uh, the, the best time that I can have. So I love it. You mean, why do I wake up? I, I, first of all, I love what I do. And every day I wake up thinking about how much more there is to do and how exciting it is. You know. You really, you know, the word, you're always solving things. It's, it's, it's a sport. You get up every day, you're ready to go. It, to me now, it's not work. I mean, it is work, but, you know, at different stages in your career, the, having to work changes into loving to work, changes into all these other things. So uh, I wake up because I really can't sit still. Mickey, let's start with just your own personal journey. Like, how did you get into apparel, retail? That's like a hard, crazy business. Like, what made you decide that was a well, good idea? Well, you, you know, I think, uh, and I know this is mostly geared to college students. So f the, the first thing is just to say that uh, I never knew what I really wanted to do ever in my younger years, but I grew up uh, in a family where my dad worked in the garment business. He, he bought buttons and piece goods for a uh, coat manufacturer. But I worked uh, weekends and holidays starting when I was probably 15 or 16 uh, in the shipping room or in, you know, jobs like putting tickets on the coats in the shipping room. So I was always surrounded by garments, if you will. And then when I was in, uh, long story short, I, in graduate school, had a job at a company that's now no longer Abraham and Strauss Department Store uh, on their summer program. And I loved what I did, a lot of action. Every day was different. But everyone's trying to figure out what they want to do by the time they're in college today. And I don't think the answer is easy. I got very lucky because I loved what I, I loved my first job in retail. And uh, that's how I got into it. So I did that. I fell in love with it and then started Thanks. my career. Yeah. yeah. And as you think back in your career, were there sort of certain moments that were like real game changers, decisions or moments where um, you were like, you know, I'm at a fork in the road. I got to go well, one or the, the other. Well, the biggest game changer in my career I was having dinner one night, uh, having been a senior executive uh, at a department store, and uh, an older, wiser, uh, su very successful friend of mine said, when I told him I was offered the presidency of Ann Taylor, uh, and I was a pretty young guy in my mid-30s, and I said, I've said no twice, and he said to me, if I were you, I would rather be the president of a $25 million business, which is what it was then, than uh, a $500 million company where I was a vice president. And I called the next day, uh, I called the, the, head of, the head person there, and I took the job. If I didn't have dinner with him that Sunday night in New York many years ago, I'm not sure. I would have been doing what I'm doing today. Yeah. And what about that resonated? Like why, when he said that, we were like, right, he's just a smart guy, I gotta go do well, it, or was you, it like, you know, he's we right? all, in a sense, I had no mentoring when I was young, because when I was young, your parents, it wasn't helicopter parents. He was, I didn't have a mentor. 
I, I admired him because, you know, when your admiration levels change over time. I admired him because he was very successful. He ran a big brokerage firm, yada yada in New York, in finance. And, and uh, I said, well, if he says that, that's probably good advice. And it was the best thing I ever did. So, Neely, as you think about, I mean, we started Warby Parker when we were in school, and you had this choice to, like, go back and work at the established job or take this entrepreneurial path. Like, what gave you confidence that that was the right idea? I think for me, it was just what I felt in, in my stomach and in my, in my gut. Um, and this felt like a, a good idea. Um, and uh, I, you're talking about I had an offer to, to McKinsey and I'd spent the summer working at, at McKinsey. You had accepted your offer to McKinsey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, were very, they were very kind. They gave me a year to, to reconsider. But I, I just, right, working at McKinsey, I would have learned a lot, tons of smart people, but I wasn't going to be up at night um, you know, thinking about how awesome the next day was going to be. Um, and there were probably going to be mornings where I was going to turn over and want to hit the snooze button. Um, and I didn't feel that way when we were working to set up Warby Parker. So uh, it's just it's something that I felt viscerally was, was the right, right move. And one of the things that like, just has always impressed me about both of you guys is the way that you, know, you sort of think about the businesses and that, you, that we build are, is that you're just so deeply attentive to detail. And so, I mean, Mickey, I know you walk stores at J. Crew all the time, like just thinking about all those little details, like what goes through your mind in those moments? You know, the F word. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to answer because it's not like you plan what goes through your mind, because I think what goes with the territory of running or owning anything is a certain obsession. And the most successful people I know, they're pretty obsessed. Now, in a good and negative way, in a sense, because you're looking at everything through the lens that you develop in running your business. When you do what we do, and you, I go into every store as a customer. I go into every restaurant as a customer. Now, you're afflicted with certain things when you do what we do. The affliction is your eyes go to whatever is not right, your eyes go to or your mind goes to whatever can be done better. And you get up every day trying to do your job better, which in a sense, it never ends. We have terrazzo floors at our Green Street store in Warby Parker. Why do we have terrazzo floors? <laughs> this might spark a, a, an argument because uh, <laughs> Mickey prefers wood floors. But, um, for, you know, terrazzo made sense for us because the inspiration for the store was uh, the main branch, New York Public Library on 42nd and 5th. Um, and as you know, that was where we discovered the Kerouac characters, Warby Pepper and Zag Parker, for which uh, Warby Parker is named. Uh, so, you know, try and take inspiration from m beautiful institutions and beautiful buildings things like that, they often have uh, great floors that um, can withstand um, the tests of time and heavy traffic, and terrazzo is, is one of those types of floors. Uh, the floor, I still don't like the floor, but at least I would have kind of uh, understood why there's a terrazzo floor. Uh, the detail of any business never ends, and you're only as good as your least effective associate. So uh, I think a lot of it's just respect for the consumer, respect for the customer, and doing the best you can do. And if you're not passionate, you don't have a commitment to what you do, and you're not paying attention to the details, then I don't think you can be as good as you are, or you can't treat your customers well. That being said, I think a lot of leaders today are so removed from day in, day out. Like, you know, we're trying to change the name of service at J. Crew now, because everyone says, or J. Crew service, it's a commodity term. So you're always trying to communicate in, in a personal way, and today it makes it impersonal. You can be very impersonal. So if you're going to lead a company, sweat the details. Yeah, unless, unless it depends on the business. If you're going to, right. it's different. We're in the customer service business, and we're dealing with consumers every single day. So we have, uh, I have what I call uh, randomly open office hours. I go on the loudspeaker and I say, Open office hours is about 1,200 people who work in, in our headquarters here. I see if anyone has any ideas, please uh, call, come and see me, send an email. Because uh, if you hang out in your headquarters building, we're all there like talking to each other. We're in a bubble. Yeah, echo chamber. 
is that we call it, we, we all live in a bubble, and I'll, and I'll call it an echo chamber because I like that name too, but if you really speak to people in the stores or customers, they don't edit for the boss. And so the real, the real world is out there, and of course it takes trust and time to develop someone who trusts to tell you something, but look, I've been practicing my craft and running companies for over 35 years, so they kind of know what they see is what they get. And once they trust you, they'll tell you everything and anything that you need to know that makes you better at your job. Just because you're called the CEO doesn't mean you know everything about anything, because you don't. So, so you call them and you ask them that, or if there's some goods up, I bring in people, price this. When we do our style guide covers every, uh, every few weeks, I always call, and aside from us in the echo chamber bubble, I then call those outside of this creative team just to look at it. And now I do that privately, this is a secret, because I also am looking for some support from my opinion, you know, wink, when it's not in agreement with the opinion of the bubble group. Like, should this cover look like this or should it look like that? So you call in 10 or 15 people, say, what do you think? And in the fashion business, you know, you're always going to make mistakes from time to time anyway. But uh, I, the loudspeaker is a fantastic tool for me. I remember one of our first meetings. Um, at the time, we'd raised over $50 million from investors. Um, and who had done a ton of due diligence on us as individuals, on the company, um, and you found out something about our product within five minutes that none of these other investors had figured out, and it was because we were at your office, you got on the loudspeaker, you said, hey, has anybody worn Warby Parker glasses before? If so, come to my office right away, and immediately eight people showed up, um, and you said, what do you like best about your glasses? Um, they would tell you what do you like worst about your glasses, um, and one of the people said, well, um, my glasses smudge a little bit. And we had had uh, um, basically a shipment of lenses that the anti-smudge coating um, wasn't as good as it usually is. One of the things that, um, that we know about building great organizations is it takes amazing people. So when there are kids, especially college kids or young people, who come to meet with you guys about joining your organizations, what is that like? like what do you look for? What, do you, what is an interview with you guys like? Well, um, it's, it's really so important, and um, I, I wish someone would explain to students and college graduates that the reality of life. In the job market today, in my opinion, and I'm not a, you know, I don't know what the real situation is other than their own thing, a lot of people are looking for work, and looking to get into a market, and I'd rather see someone who works at any job than not take a job at all. I don't look for more fancy colleges than not. I don't look for that. So uh, I look for an energy and a curiosity, and I interview all of, I used to interview everyone in the company. Now uh, I really interview uh, people where I know I can make a difference, all merchants, designers, all marketing, and all senior level positions. I want to sit down and see, and it depends on the level. College students, I expect different than a senior executive who's been there. I expect different uh, achievements at every level. Uh, I look at the resumes and I say, okay, this was done with the guidance counselor. They took out all your waiting jobs, your construction jobs in the summer, and all the jobs I love to see in a resume. Because they, you get your ass kicked, you work hard, they're not jobs of privilege, and, uh, you know, and I see all the fancy intern jobs. And, um, and, I, and I just kind of wade through that and say, what's the real essence of this person? Because they come in, they're interviewing and they're acting. I just want to get a real sense of curiosity. Not that you love fashion, not that you love Madewell or J. Crew, but that you really work hard you're a little obsessive, you're a little insecure, because I ask everyone to rate themselves on the interviews. I want to learn from them, because I want to hear about their jobs, I want to hear about their experiences in life, yeah. and what they've done. Yeah. Now, I don't blame all of them, because there's a lot of rehearsing and anxiety that goes into an interview. Neely, what would you add to this? Um, well, you know, I, th I think what we look for is, 
uh, people that are curious because you need curiosity in order to solve problems. And the challenge is that uh, often what makes you successful in school does is not the same skill set that makes you successful in the workplace, right? In school, it's highly structured. You're getting directives from the professor or the teacher. Um, you're told what to do uh, every day. Um, m most uh, companies, it's, it's pretty unstructured, and especially fast-growing companies, um, there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty, and you need people that are going to hunt for problems themselves, be self-directed, and then identify solutions and hopefully find multiple solutions, recommend the top one, either get permission to pursue it or just pursue it on, on their own. And um, entitlement is just, it, 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 it's problematic on every single level, right? It impedes teamwork and collaboration and all work these days is done within a team. Um, it impedes learning because you think you know everything already and you can't uh, do anything new or innovate um, if you're not open to discovering new things. How passionate are they about Warby Parker and do they live and breathe um, what we do? Uh, and if they don't, then you know they could be the smartest person, the most competent person in the world, uh, but they don't have a place here. And I always think like, there may be a great role for somebody, it just might not be at our company. Like, you just might not be the right fit there, here. There, there's an energy that people have, and sometimes they are shy and anxious or nervous, so you have to kind of get beyond that, but you, you love those that are trying to please, and are there, and, and their eyes are bulging out of their heads because they're trying to impress yeah. you, and, you know, look, I, I, again, you know, I've been doing it for so long, Team is critical, but the leadership of the team is hugely critical. Yeah. Uh, and the boss always sets the tone. The active, involved boss or leader sets the tone. They set the culture. They really drive the business. All right, a couple questions for, from our kids. Uh, Adam from Baruch, how do you basically, in parentheses, market apparel or eyewear in the new digital age? Go ahead, Neil, because you're, 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 you're the digital age person. Um, I think it's the same way that you've always done it. I, you know, the, the first thing um, is you have to make a, a product that um, is something that people want, so it's aesthetically pleasing, it's decent quality, it's priced. Uh, appropriately, right? So those are all the basics. And sometimes when people say marketing, really only they mean promotion, but all these other pieces like price um, and, and the product are integral to, to marketing. Um, you know, we've built Warby Parker on word of mouth. Um, and that's by, you know, I think delivering value and great customer experiences. People want to tell their friends about us. And still, five years in, over half our traffic and sales come through word of mouth. Um, and, you know, when people often talk about social media and shareability and uh, virality, right, that's word of mouth. And it's the same um, sort of human mechanics of sharing that have existed for millennia. Leah from UPenn asks, in a few words, What's the hardest part of your job? I think what you need to do is be so focused about achieving results in a quality way that the hardest parts fall to the wayside because if you let them get the best of you, then you're not going to last a week in your job. And it's really complex running a, a business today. Yeah, focus. Focus like crazy and, and I find editing. You must be a great editor in running any organization. Yep. Uh, the other hard part is figuring out where the puck is going, especially in today's environment now. We're in the midst of huge changes, in, particularly in the apparel world. Neil, Mickey, it's been amazing to have you here. Thank you so much for doing University. And for all of you guys out there, thanks so much for listening.